Okay, guys, so today we're going to be talking about Locke's Second Treatise. Some background info. I suspect that many of you will already be familiar with Locke, uh, even if it's just with his name, because it shows up in a bunch of other classes. It shows up in pop culture and all that good stuff. And that's not without reason. This guy was very influential uh, in terms of metaphysics, epistemology, and political philosophy. And it's that latter category that we're concerned with, right? Because that's where the ethics lies. And the specifics of his political philosophy should be notably important for us, if not familiar or palatable, uh, because Locke was a really pivotal figure in the American Revolution. Uh, Lockean principles kind of led to the Declaration of Independence as is. So it'll be interesting to see how this stuff unfolds. So here's the opening question for today. What is the proper relation between individual and state? And this is a question we, we already started thinking about when we did the Crido the other day. And it's a question that we're going to keep asking for the rest of the semester. If we were to state the question otherwise, we might say, how much power should the state have over its citizens? Should it be an absolute power or close to absolute? Should it be moderate? Right? Should the state have some say in how you conduct your life but not total say? Or should there be none? Is the state inherently immoral? These are questions we want to start to consider. So let's take a look at what Locke says specifically in the text. In section two, he says, To understand political power right, and derive it from its original, we must consider what state all men are naturally in. And that state is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and to dispose of their possessions and persons as they think fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. A state also of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another. So when Locke uses this phrase, what state all men are naturally in, he's talking about this thing that we call the state of nature. And you may have noticed that the beginning of this section was of, of the state of nature. Um, again, another phrase you may have heard before. You can understand the state of nature to be the way things were or would be in the absence of government in the absence of these governmental structures that order us. Like, what is human nature ordinarily like, right? What is our original relationship to each other and to ourselves and to freedom and things like that? And according to Locke, the state of nature is a state of perfect freedom. Uh, a human is absolutely free, independent of these you can think of them as like artificial or after the fact state constructions. That's not to say they're not important. It's not to say that they're not real. It's just to say that before they existed, we were already free, All right? So Locke is not one, uh, not going to be one of those people that say that the state gives us freedom. He's going to be someone who says, no, no, we already had freedom, and the state is what protects some of those freedoms, All right? So this is a discussion we're going to wind up being in uh, for the next however minutes. And by the way, if this already sounds familiar, it's because of that Americanism thing I said. Think about the Declaration. Think about the Constitution, right? These things aren't granting you rights. If you read them, what they say is you already have these rights. They were endowed by the Creator, quote unquote, which the, the God language may, may not be palatable for, for everyone, but the idea is that you have these rights before government exists, and government just protects them. Um, and Locke thinks these laws are the laws of nature, right? And the laws of nature are where everything, from, uh, from where everything derives. And this state is also equality. So we're all equally free. It's not like in the state of nature, there are social castes or like natural... I guess there are natural power hierarchies, but there aren't governmental hierarchies that exist in this state of nature. We're all equal. So to continue, he says, the state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges everyone 
and reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind, who will but consult it, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So that's the key, right? The law of nature states that we are all free, we are all equal, no one is born having political power over another person, and no one is to harm anyone in terms of his body, in terms of his freedom, uh, in terms of her passion to act, I suppose, is another way you can look at this, right? So the idea is you have control over yourself, right? You can make decisions for yourself. You can make decisions about your own body. You can make decisions about what you want to turn out to be in life, but you can't make those decisions for other people, right? You don't want to hurt someone. You don't want to take their property, anything like that. And we've run into this concept, uh, of negative liberty versus positive liberty, not by name, but the concepts are focusing, or we're starting to focus on the concepts in the background. So let's parse this out. Negative liberty is this idea, and by the way, when we use the terms negative and positive, we don't mean bad and good. We mean negative and positive in more mathematical terms. Because as you're gonna see, negative liberty has to do with the absence of something whereas positive liberty is going to have to do with the presence of something. So that, that's how it's negative and positive. It's an absence and a presence, not a bad and a good. So negative liberty is freedom from external constraints, freedom from inter interference, right, or any kind of restriction. And when we talk about freedom from external constraints, we mean freedom from legal restrictions. Right? We mean freedom from laws. Freedom from state intervention. Like I'm free to do something without you or a body of people or a state telling me I can't do that or limiting what I can and can't do. So examples of negative liberty would be being able to speak freely without restrictions or being able to use my body how one wishes, right? Like how can you tell me what I can and cannot put in my body? How can you tell me that I should use my body in this way and not another way? Right, so being able to use your body how you wish is an example of negative liberty or negative freedom. And the last example I put here is freedom from taxation. Uh, and you can also see, again, how this is related to the American Revolution because taxation is usually thought of to be uh, like an imposition upon my freedom. It's usually thought to be a form of coercion uh, whereby the government kind of takes the fruits of your labor. So if you're a proponent of negative liberty, which not everyone is, uh, but if you're a proponent of negative liberty, you would be against taxation, against restrictions on speech, against restrictions on what we should do with our bodies. And positive liberty is different. Positive liberty isn't the freedom from, it is the freedom to, right? The freedom to do certain things, to have certain things, the freedom to actualize one's desires, right? The freedom to become who you want to become. And positive liberty proponents don't just mean this in the sense that the negative liberty proponents do. For them, it's not just about not having laws. For them, sometimes you need laws because laws are the things that grant you the conditions for the possibility of actualizing your desires. So sometimes in order to have positive liberty, you need government law, right? You need state intervention, Public education is an example of this. Public education isn't just a thing that's there outside of government. Like, no, this is a, a publicly funded program. Right? The government collects taxes, distributes them in a certain way, and gives people an education. And that education can grant them a kind of freedom that they wouldn't have otherwise, that they wouldn't have in a world of purely negative liberty. Uh, welfare programs are the same thing. And the right to an attorney is, is kind of like that too, right? We're giving you something by means of law. And this giving you something is akin to a kind of freedom. And Locke is going to be a proponent of negative liberty, right? These natural rights, this natural law, this natural freedom that he's talking about is this freedom from coercion, right? The freedom from a state or a state-like body is what he's going to latch on to here. Of course, there's exceptions, not everyone 
is free all the time. Um, he says if you break the law, if you attack someone, if you steal, if you do some kind of criminal activity, then of course uh, society has a right to restrict your freedom. And that's the only exception, right? Because otherwise, in the state of nature, there are no um, ways you could be subject to political authority. But if you hurt someone, if you break the law, then you kind of give up that freedom. But then we get into this discussion of moving out of the state of nature, right? Because we don't live in the state of nature. Um, and some people question even if there was really such a thing as state of nature outside of theorizing. Um, but we opened up the discussion with the state of nature, and now the discussion is going to shift towards how do we move out of the state of nature? What does that look like? What is the result? And if we skip ahead to section 95 here, Locke says, Men being, as has been said by nature, all free, equal, and independent, no one can be put out of this estate, and subjected to the political power of another without his own consent. The only way whereby anyone divests himself of his natural liberty and puts on the bonds of civil society is by agreeing with other men to join and unite into a community for their comfortable, safe, and peaceable living one amongst another in a secure enjoyment of their properties and a greater security against any that are not of it. Okay, so the only way you can be rightfully subject to political power is through consent. Right? So you're born naturally free, and you'll remain naturally free unless you consent to being put under authority. And the way you do this is by agreeing to come together with other people and unite as one, right? As some kind of community, as some kind of single body where the collective acts as one. So to continue, he says, for when any number of men have, by the consent of every individual, made a community, they have thereby made that community one body with the power to act as one body, which is only by the will and determination of the majority. For that which acts any community being only the consent of the individuals of it, and it being necessary to that which is one body to move away, or move one way rather, it is necessary that the body should move that way whither the greater force carries it, which is the consent of the majority, or else it is impossible it should act or continue one body, one community, which the consent of every individual that has united into it agreed that it should, and so everyone is bound by that consent to be concluded by the majority. I apologize, by the way, by some of the, the older English mannerisms and the comma splices, but we should be able to parse through that. So, again, Locke is saying we come together as one body, right? We come to this agreement to establish political authority, and this body is governed by the majority. So Locke believes that democracy is the way that civil societies are run. And he says it's necessary that you govern this body democratically or else it would be impossible to continue as one body, right? Because as you're going to see in the next passage, you can't just have everyone doing what they want all the time, right? Because then that's not a body. That, that's still just a bunch of people. You need to come to some kind of consensus about how things are going to be governed. And the way that Locke thinks it's correct to do this is through majority rules, right? Because he says, and thus every man by consenting with others to make one body politic under one government puts himself under an obligation to every one of that society to submit to the determination of the majority and to be concluded by it or else this original compact whereby he with others incorporates into one society would signify nothing and be no compact if he be left free, and under no ties than he was before in the state of nature. So when you join into a group, into a government, into a society, whatever you want to call it, you become obligated to everyone else in that society. In a sense, you're giving up your individuality because it's no longer just about you. 
Um, and it's not bad, right? He thinks it's a good thing because true, in the state of nature, you are absolutely free. But that means so is everyone else. And just because you have natural rights, this doesn't mean that everyone's going to respect your natural rights. So in other words, if we were in the state of nature and someone came up and stole my money and burned my house down, and I was like, hey, you can't do that. I have this natural right not to be imposed upon. You think that person's going to care? Probably not. So the fact that we have natural rights does not mean that natural rights are always going to be respected. And because of that, we need to unite into a government and the government is going to make sure that everyone protects those natural rights. Remember, that's what the social contract is. This is exactly what uh, Glaucon said in Book Two of the Republic, remember? He says, it's naturally good to do injustice, but naturally bad to suffer it. And the badness of suffering injustice far outweighs the goodness of doing it. So we come to an agreement neither to do nor suffer injustice. And so we pass laws that kind of keep us honest, that, that makes it so that we're following through on our word. And so when we do that, we're giving up a little freedom. But that's okay. right? Locke thinks it's okay to give up a little bit of freedom if it means protecting our most essential freedoms, if it means security. And so another aspect of doing that is you're obligated to other people right? You're not just an atomistic individual. And you have to submit to the determination of the majority, right? You can't join a democratic body and then only follow the rules when you like the outcome. This doesn't make any sense, right? Like, why did you even come together? This was a problem that the laws brought up in the Crito. Uh, and maybe some of us thought this was kind of authoritarian, but I mean, there's a point, right? It's like, if you agree to be subject to the will of the majority, that means you're subject to it all the time, when it's good, and when you like it, and even when it goes against you, right? Because there would be no point in joining the body, right? The whole point of the compact was to come together as one, and to listen to the will of the majority, but if you join and then just don't listen to the democratic body, then there was no point in having that original uh, compact. And he says, you would just be in the state of nature again. So wasn't the point to leave that? To continue, he says, for if the consent of the majority shall not in reason be received as the act of the whole and conclude every individual Nothing but the consent of every individual can make anything to be the act of the whole. But such a consent is next to impossible ever to be had. If we add the variety of opinions and con contrariety of interests, which unavoidably happen in all collections of men, the coming into society upon such terms would be only like Cato's coming into the theater, only to go out again. For the majority cannot conclude the rest, there they cannot act as one body and consequently would be immediately dissolved again. Again, the idea is if you don't submit to the will of the majority, all you have left is the consent of every single individual. And how is that going to work? Like, how are you going to get 100% of people to agree on something? It seems like it's never going to happen. Like, if they do, great, go for it. But most of the time, that's not going to happen. So you need to get the second best thing. And the second best thing, besides 100%, is having a majority, right? 51%. And you want to start to think about this question, right? I posed this question when we did the Crito, but is there a way to govern society that's not democratic? I mean, obviously there are ways, right? You may say like dictatorship. But I suppose the question is, is, is the emphasis is on that word civil, right? Is there a good way that a government can run or that any kind of governance could occur that doesn't involve democracy? Because again, we fall on democracy as the default and, and maybe there's good reason for that. Like maybe it's, it's the best that we have. 
But we want to start to think, are there other ways? Uh, is there a way that, that decentralizes power even more than democracy? Is there a way to centralize power more than democracy? Right? Do we want more centralized government or less centralized government? Um, how do we compare a pure democracy versus a democratic republic? What about the absence of government? I don't know. And here's some other questions. Okay, let's brush aside the democracy issue for the moment. Let's say, yeah, when we agree to be part of this society, we agree to be part of a democracy. Okay, but what counts as consent? Like, okay, some people are going to consent to be part of this political authority, but how? How do they do that? What exactly counts as consent? Do you have to say, I, blank, 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 consent to this society? Or is it a little looser than that? Can you ever opt out? The question is basically, how does one enter into a social contract? Right. So one issue is, is there such a thing? Another issue is, is it, is it good? Should we act in accordance with social contract theory? And a third issue is, okay, granting that it's a thing and that it's a good thing, how do we actually enter into that good thing? And Locke gives a very, very interesting answer. And I think here is where he's going to make some points that you may find a bit controversial uh, compared to the previous stuff. Because I think so far this has been very palatable. Again, because in the society where we live, we're so used to this idea of democracy um, and equality. So it's like, all right, I get that. But this issue of consent is the really interesting point in Locke. Uh, he says, every man being, as has been showed, naturally free, and nothing being able to put him into subje subjection to any earthly power but his own consent, it is to be considered what shall be understood to be a sufficient declaration of a man's consent to make him subject to the laws of any government. There is a common distinction of an express and a tacit consent which will concern our present case. Nobody doubts but an express consent of any man entering into any society makes him a perfectly member, or a perfect member rather, of that society, a subject of that government. The difficulty is, what ought to be looked upon as a tacit consent, and how far it binds? That is, how far anyone shall be looked on to have consented, and thereby submitted to any government where he has made no expressions of it at all. Right, so what counts as consent? Two forms. There's two types of consent. He says there's express consent and there's tacit consent. Another way of understanding this distinction is explicit and implicit consent. Express is explicit and tacit is implicit. It's pretty easy to remember. So let's start with the easier one. Express consent is when you come out right and say, I consent to this thing. I am going to be part of this agreement. Or you sign your name on a contract. Right? It's express. It's out in the open. No one denies that. Right? So if you have express consent, obviously you're going to be part of society. The difficulty comes when we talk about tacit or implicit consent. Because sometimes there are ways of consenting to a scheme without explicitly expressing consent. And this is super interesting. And that's the question. What counts as implicit consent? If we grant that it exists, we have to start thinking about particular ways that we might implicitly consent to things. And we are talking about the issue of government. That's our ultimate aim. But these questions pertain to everything, right? Because in order for the modes of implicit consent to be valid for government, they have to be valid, period. So they have to exist not only on the issue of government, but in a more general level when we're talking about consent. Well, he gives an answer. And this is the interesting part. He says, And to this I say, that every man that hath any possessions or enjoyment of any part of the dominions of any government doth thereby give his tacit consent and is as far forth obliged to obedience to the laws of that government during such enjoyment as anyone under it, whether this his possession be of land, 
to him and his heirs forever, or a lodging only for a week, or whether it be barely traveling freely on the highway. And in effect, it reaches as far as the very being of anyone within the territories of that government. So these are all the things that count as implicit consent. If you have possessions, Locke thinks you're enjoying the protection of the government. You're accepting state services because you're accepting uh, protection, right? You're enjoying things that the state has provided to you. And so it could be a possession of a thing. It could be possession of a land that's being protected, right? You don't have to constantly look over your shoulder because you know there's going to be some agency that's going to protect you if anything happens. Since there's consequences because of the state's force, um, less people are, are going to have an incentive to try to attack you or your land. But it's not just that. It's not just possessing land. It's not just property. Even if you lodge for a short period of time within a place, that counts. So if you go on vacation, you can think of it like that. If you go on vacation to a place and you're only there for like a week, it seems like Locke would say that counts as consent. And while you're there for that week, you have to obey their laws and you're rightfully subject to their political power because you didn't have to be there, right? You chose to go there. And when you choose to go to a place, this is a voluntary decision and there are consequences of that voluntary decision. And in this case, that consequence is being subject to the political power uh, of the state in which you're lodging. But it's even more than that. Traveling on the highway, using roads. You hear this getting thrown around sometimes, right? A lot of roads are publicly funded. So if you're driving on the road, even if you're in your own car, you're still benefiting from a state service because they're the people that built the roads. And so in exchange for that convenience, you should obey their laws. And it's even looser than that. Not even just staying on the highway, not even just staying there for a week. Even if you're in the territory of the government. Like, once I step in the territory of your government and I'm there for like five seconds, that seems to be consent. Right? It doesn't matter if I'm there a week or a month or ten minutes. I am in the territory of the government. And by being in the territory of the government, I am consenting to those laws. And so here's the recap. For Locke, remember, one is born naturally free, and by this he means you're free from impositions or restrictions. That's that negative freedom. So one is born naturally free and can only be subject to political authority by means of consent. And there are two types of consent, the express and the tacit. And the express was the easy one, and the, the examples of tacit consent, like we said, owning property, residing, traveling on roads, or being in a state's territory. And ultimately, being subject to legitimate political authority means obeying the will of a democratic body or some kind of democratic-like body that has been established. And that's the main point in this section of the second treatise. So here are some questions you want to consider when you're trying to digest this material, when you're trying to come up with arguments when you're trying to respond here. Right? One question is, Locke asserts the existence of these things called natural rights, but do they actually exist? Are they real? Like, what evidence do we have for natural rights? I mean, they sound good. And if you assert a God, as Locke does, then it's easier to believe in this. But absent of a God... How do we know we have natural rights? And even if you believe natural rights exist, is Locke right to characterize the negative rights as the natural ones? I don't know. Not everyone agrees on this. As you see, or as you're going to see in the coming weeks, Mill, for example, is a classical liberal in the same way that Locke is. But unlike Locke, he doesn't believe in natural rights. He thinks rights are going to be... Uh, useful constructions. And that goes back to his being a utilitarian, but you want to question Locke. Maybe there are natural rights. I don't know. What arguments can we come up with for them? And are those arguments good? Uh, second type of question, is democracy the rightful method of social governance? 
it's surely a method. Um, it's probably not the worst, but is it the best? And even think back to what happened to Socrates here as an example. Because remember, Socrates was sentenced to death basically for going around pissing people off, just asking them questions that made them feel uncomfortable. Should the majority of people have power to sentence someone to death for doing something they don't like? Is there problems that we run into for majority rules? Like, what if the majority of the country votes to enslave the minority? Is that good? Doesn't seem like it. Maybe natural rights protect that from happening, but again, we need an argument for natural rights. So what else exists besides democracy? I don't know, maybe a democratic republic, uh, maybe some kind of oligarchy where there's a few people in charge, maybe anarchy, maybe no government is the right way to govern society. I don't know. That's for you guys to decide. And the last type of question you want to consider is, do we really consent to a social contract merely by using public services? In other words, when you travel to another state or when you travel to another country for a week, does your being there for a week mean you have to follow all their, all their laws? Like if you go to another country and break a law and then they punish you, is it right for them to do that? Is it right for you to have to accept any and all political authority to the extent that you're using the services provided by that political authority? I don't know. This could be right. It could be partially right. It could be wrong. I'm not sure. This is for you guys to decide. Uh, next week, we'll continue the conversation about the role of individual and state, uh, about consent and all that good stuff. But for now, we should be done. So I'll see you around.